Hello, I'm Robin Vincent and welcome to the January NAM special edition of Molten Music Monthly. Well, the NAM show was extraordinary this year and not just the show itself, but the build up to it. In fact, I would say that most of the stuff probably came out before we even got to the show. There was very little at the actual show that we weren't aware of before we got there. And so it felt a bit like that, you know, once people were showing videos from the show, it's like, yeah, all right, well, we already know about that. But I guess it was great to see these things in person. So for this video, because there was just so much stuff, I've tried to narrow it down to, well, not exactly 12 products, but 12 manufacturers of products because there were a few notable ones that released more than one thing. And so these are the, the products or the ideas or the concepts that I thought brought something special to the show. And so coming up, we have Korg. They brought along old synths, new synths, reinvented synths, prototype synths, little custom synths, and a really rather nice piano. Sequential aced the modern mono. Empress effects put an entire modular system inside a modular module. Roland got all zen about their core. Modal went bigger and smaller. Arturia did a bit more key stepping and micro freaking. Erica Synths are banging their own bass line. Pittsburgh Modular are repeating themselves. Qubit does some bending, shaping, modeling and ratcheting. Noise Engineering kicks off a platform. 2HB has some lunch. And although Behringer weren't actually at the show, I'd be an idiot if I didn't talk about it. But first, MIDI 2.0. MIDI 2.0. There's been lots and lots of talk about MIDI 2.0 and it still makes you scratch your head and go, what? What? Or at least it does a bit for me. I mean, there was a big meeting over at NAM. Everyone got together, everyone who's anyone got together and talked about MIDI 2.0 and there was some kind of vote. There was some kind of annual general meeting. There was some kind of success and some kind of something was decided, but information on it is still really weirdly scarce. I mean, if you go to the midi.org place, the place where MIDI resides in some kind of spiritual form, they tell you that they had meetings, but they don't really tell you the outcome of them. There's certainly lots of talk about what the protocol is, uh, what it means, how to implement it, but there's still frustratingly little information on what actually happens. What does it actually mean? What is, when I plug this into this, what is going to occur? That's the big missing piece as far as I can see. I mean, maybe somebody's done a video on it. I don't know, I'd love to do a video on it. You know, somebody send me some MIDI 2.0 stuff and I'll do a video on it doing its stuff. So once again, yeah, year after year, MIDI 2.0 comes up and there's more meetings and more discussions and and the the, the pace of change. The pace of change is extraordinarily slow, but I don't know, uh, maybe maybe this is the year. They seem to think that this is definitely the year. I mean, the one thing that we did have is we had a MIDI controller that was released that was MIDI 2.0 compatible, compliant, ready or something. And that was a Roland A88, was it, Mark, something or other? Big, long 88 keyboard thing with a couple of knobs and pads here, yeah, looked very nice not very deep so it's a good space saving thing but that apparently is ready for MIDI 2.0 whatever it is that that means well I mean if I can put it in a nutshell from what it is that I've grasped so far is that MIDI 2.0 is essentially an attempt to stick more into MIDI because MIDI is pretty stupid it doesn't you know I mean it's MIDI is an extraordinary invention which has allowed us to connect up synthesizers and uh, workstations and bits of MIDI gear and control one thing from another. So you can have one keyboard and you can play a dozen synths or 16 synths, I suppose. It's awesome, but it's also 40 years old and is remarkably stupid in a lot of situations where you sit down and try to get two things to talk to each other and it's just, oh, it's a bind and it's difficult when you're going through menus trying to find, you know, locals on and off or globals and which channel am I on anyway and Okay, this was working and then I've turned it off and now it's no longer working. I've got to remap everything and I want to control this. Control. Why isn't this knob the same as why, you know, that kind of thing. And then you have MIDI timing problems and you've got resolution issues and 
there's a whole load of stuff within MIDI that, although it is awesome, and people keep slapping me every time I cast doubt upon the awesomeness of MIDI, you know, it's awesome, but it has its problems, and it's not always as brilliant, perhaps, as we perceive it to be. And certainly I have found working with control voltage just so refreshingly fantastic in comparison to faffing around with MIDI and faffing around in sequences and automation lanes and assigning controllers. Oh, you know, so MIDI 2.0 is designed to finally push us forward to a situation where MIDI works like we kind of think it's supposed to anyway. So in essence, probably the most important thing about MIDI 2.0, from what I can gather, is it's a two-way conversation. What does that mean? Well, you've got your door, assuming that's MIDI 2.0 compatible. You've got a synth, which is MIDI 2.0 compatible. You plug the two together and they go, whatcha? And he goes, oh, all right, how you doing? Not too bad, send us your stuff. Yeah, all right, no problem. And they have this conversation and you get a patch list out, you get all the controller lists out. Your door goes, great, these are all the controllers. I'm gonna map all this stuff to it. Uh, and these are all the patch names, they're gonna show up. And the synth goes, great, yeah, let's go. And you can just start doing your thing and it's all there. You're not having to, to map or MIDI learn. You're not having to write down the name of patches or name your track what the patch is because it already knows what it is. And all that information is, is saved and sent in both directions and it's fan flipping tabulous. You can then have a MIDI 2.0 MIDI controller, which automatically maps itself to all the same things. You can load up a profile to say that you know, this is a subtractive synthesizer. And so it automatically maps itself to that kind of arrangement and all the instruments do the same. If it's a subtractive synthesizer, it will respond to that profile. If it's an organ, it will respond to an organ profile and everybody knows what everybody else is doing and it all just works brilliantly. And that I think could be fantastic. The other thing it does is it increases resolution. So you no longer got 127, 128 values. You can now have a gazillion values on every single controller. So that brings the resolution of MIDI much closer or up to the sort of resolution you get with control voltage, which again is awesome. The other factor is the MPE side of things where you get expressive per note control. So per note modulation, per note pitch bend, and control and expressive information like you do with MPE. But the advantage of MIDI 2.0 is that we now have an expanded channel set. So you can do it all without using up all the channels because currently MPE uses up a whole number of channels in order to achieve this per note uh, polyphonic expression that it does. With MIDI 2.0, that sort of limitation is removed. So you've got MPE going on all over the place. So that's that's the basic that's the basic idea as I understand it at this time, and all of it's really good and really positive and could be really helpful if it ever arrives. The one other thing that's that's rather awesome about it is that the majority of the protocols within um, MIDI 2 can run on MIDI 1, so it's very backwards compatible. Some stuff won't, for instance, the MPE stuff, you can't create new MIDI channels within MIDI 1, there's only the 16, and so to run MPE on MIDI 1, you have to use multiple MIDI channels to make that work. With MIDI 2.0, there won't be that limitation, but obviously those two are not compatible with each other. But all the other stuff, the, the two-way communication, the mapping and other bits and pieces are all apparently able to run on MIDI 1. So regardless of whether you have MIDI 2.0 enabled stuff or not, you're going to find there are still advantages to MIDI 2. Most of that's going to happen on USB or network, or it can work on 5-pin DIN, but again, you will lose perhaps some of the facilities of MIDI 2.0. But hopefully, ultimately, 2020 is the year for MIDI 2.0. That's That could be, potentially, Really exciting if if it ever if it ever turns up. So Korg then Korg are are bringing their A game at the moment. They are they are just flying. They're on top of things. They're releasing new things all the time. Exciting things, and it really must be an awesome place to work at the moment. They really have grabbed hold of the idea that let's just be awesome, and they're and they kind of gone with that. I think that's fantastic. So they kicked off with the wave state. This leaked a little bit beforehand, and it was actually in early January that we first saw the wave state. What is it? It's a little synth about this big, which is kind of the spiritual successor to the wave station. Wave station is an old Korg synth from 
that was based on uh, wavetables and this idea of wave sequencing where you create a patch that has different waves within that patch that are sequenced. Oh, yeah, so, you know, so you press a thing and it goes and it makes different noises for every step. It's like having an inbuilt step sequencer where each step has its own waveform. That kind of thing. So you have patches that are very uh, mobile, very moving about, very evolutionary, very changing, very rhythmic, all that kind of shenanigans. What the wave station didn't have was anything like any kind of proper real-time control. It was a classic sort of black slab of a synthesizer with a couple of buttons and a menu. You know, for some reason we liked that. There was a period in our synthesizer history where we thought that was awesome. And so, and so that's what they did. One of the big advantage of the wave state is that it's got a whole load of knobs and buttons and bits and pieces on it, which are far more inviting than the wave station ever was. The flip side or the caveat to that is that there's still a lot of menu diving. From what I've heard from people who have played on one, there is some real time control. That's great, but that's mostly over, you know, modulation filters, the usual sort of stuff. But the programming of the wave sequencing itself is still kind of menu heavy and you have to get down in there and you have to to really dig into it in terms of programming a sound now that doesn't have to be a bad thing you know it's like when people talk about fn synthesis and how difficult that is yeah sure but people still did it people still programmed these things and you get a lot of uh, you know joy and satisfaction out of digging into a synthesizer regardless of its architecture and pulling out and designing and sculpting sounds that's okay so that's the sort of thing you have to do with the wave state and that sort of brings me to think that uh, synthesizers like the wave state are kind of uh, a bit more like preset instruments and again i don't mean that unkindly i mean that it will come with a huge bunch of awesome sounds and it's the sort of synthesizer where you go, wow, yeah, that's a great sound, and then you tweak it to your liking. That's really, I think, where the wave state sits, as opposed to something like a, an analog synthesizer where you're crafting a sound from scratch, or even something more like the, the Hydrosynth or the, the Argon 8 where you're taking a wavetable synthesizer, so a digital synthesizer, and bringing all those parameters to the surface. So the wave state for me just seems to be like a different vibe, more of a preset vibe, more of an old school digital synth vibe with a lot of controls on the top. That's just my take on it. Next up was the MS-20 FS full-sized MS-20. Now this is an official reissue of the original Korg MS-20. Now they've messed around with the MS-20 for years. They released a, a mini version with little mini keys which was kind of great and cute and that was sort of in the time before everyone had got seriously back into vintage synths and so it was kind of cute and we liked it and stuff. And then they released a kit version for those people who were really into the idea and they could build their own full-size MS-20. Well now they've come back with their own proper pre-built reissued four different colors which are fantastic Korg MS-20. Great. What is an MS-20? Oh, it's a fierce synth. It's a bit like that K2 that Behringer released uh, a while ago. It's kind of modeled on that idea. So yeah, a cool old-fashioned synth with its own way of doing things. Quite large patch jacks to it. It's got a couple of different filters in there because they, they change the filter over time. And so it's got both models in there, I think. It's got an external input for audio processing, and it just is what it is. It's a fierce, grungy, gritty, angry synthesizer with bags of character that's going to be an awful lot of fun to play with. Talking of reissues, of course, the big one, the huge big one, was Korg's ARP 2600. Yeah, how about that? So uh, the ARP 2600 is one of the most desirable synths on the planet. It's a monophonic synthesizer, comes in a large case. They did this whole tease campaign with somebody pushing a great big flight case around, just demonstrating how absolutely unportable it is. And then dragging this huge thing out, slapping it on a desk, matching keyboard in front, patch cables, off you go. Now this was leaked by Jean-Michel Jarre of all people who mentioned it in a in a, one of his little videos, but it's an 
it's just an awesome thing to see because it is very much a, a classic synthesizer the sort of thing you would see in, in black and white photos in old magazines and bits and pieces that you just go wow you can't believe such things existed well now it exists again and Korg have worked with uh, the original one of the uh, co-founders of ARP to create an as authentic experience as you can possibly get Again, it has different filters in it, I think because of the different versions, but essentially it's built on the best sounding version of the, the 2600. It comes with the keyboard, which has the arpeggiator and other bits and pieces built into that. And it looks amazing, fits into this flight case, and it's several thousand pounds. <laughs> They're only making a limited run of them, so I think 400 in Europe, 400 in America, or something like that. And they're already sold out, I believe. So they were onto a winner with that thing. I mean, it's an extraordinary thing to look at. I imagine it's amazing to play with. It's just a monophonic synth. And, but it's, it's somehow a piece of history. It's very, very classic. And I can absolutely see the attraction and see why people love the idea. Now, something weird happened in that during the initial coverage of this, when you're trying to find photos of it and there were leaks and teasers and all that sort of thing, discovered some photos on Guitar Center, which is a, a big shop in America, that were different. Different. They were put up on a page that was selling the, the pre-order of the ARP 2600 and yet these pictures were weird and you put them side by side with the other pictures we'd, we'd found and it appeared to be like a mini version. Now this was fueled absolutely because Korg had called this the ARP 2600 FS. The FS on the end of a Korg product means full sized because they've released mini versions like the ARP Odyssey, they did a mini version of that and then they did an FS version, a full size version. So the fact that this had FS written on the end made you think or made me think that well maybe they're going to make a mini version, you know, that we can all have perhaps. And these images on Guitar Center seem to absolutely confirm it because it was a smaller version. Uh, it, you know, it wasn't labeled up properly. There were obviously renders. They weren't actual photographs. And so it seemed to be that Korg were going to release a mini version. And I have to say that that idea, that that rumor is still very much out there. However, I have heard from reliable sources who have spoken to people who have spoken to people who know some bloke who spoke to somebody at Korg. And they said, no, it was just an idea. It was a concept that they had a while ago. And so they made some renders and put it together and thought, mm, yeah, maybe we could do that. And then they decided to do this big one instead. And you think, oh, all right then. But then why does Guitar Center have these photos? these images why why do they have them so yeah okay i believe you call that's that's fine but also i think mm, i don't know maybe but anyway Korg was running workshops on their nts1 new tech little synthesizer box which is a fantastic little crazy thing and they are seemingly becoming available and along with that they have brought in this custom panel which is very interesting. So it's a, a custom panel that goes on top of it or inside it or something, and it essentially reveals all of the ins and outs and programming possibilities, allowing you to completely reprogram the thing, stick in your own interface, create your own user interface, load up your own software, your firmware, that kind of thing, and do what the heck you like with it. The other thing, I mean, this Korg thing's going on forever. The other thing, that they did that caused a bit of a stir was that there was a, a shot that I saw stole off Instagram of something they were calling the OP6. OP6. And it looked like a DX7 clone. And that's kind of what it is. <laughs> so it appears that Korg are working on an FM based synthesizer. I mean, it was, you know, it, it was a big thing. It looked like, you know, good old fashioned black. Uh, synthesizer thing with all the algorithms printed on it and stuff a few sliders you know as a nod to the modern way we're trying to approach fm now where we're trying to actually give access to parameters and that's good and like i say it caused like a bit of a stir but all we know is that the the core guy uh luke from korg who's always doing the demos he had no idea <laughs> about it and it seemed to be up on a wall behind glass and essentially it's kind of an idea it's a prototype not even a prototype it's just a, a concept that yeah maybe we'll do maybe we'll do a bit of this i think if they did people would love it if they did so they should 
but they should put more controls on the front i think but other than that it was called the op 6 and we may see one we may not and then last of all they've updated the sv1 to the sv2 this is their gorgeous curvy retro vintage looking stage piano i've always wanted one i love the idea of it i love the tube in it i love the you know the, the small selection of pianos that's all i want i just really all i'm after is a Rhodes piano with maybe a couple of options and a bit of uh, grit to it and lovely and they've released uh, a new version 88 keys 76 keys they've also released one that's got speakers built in so you can run it in your house in your living room somewhere nice and play it without having to have an amp or headphones knocking around brilliant love it i would love to have one korg please just send me one an sv2s would be lovely 76 keys is plenty you know 88 if you must but 76 will do and i kind of need two i need one for the studio and one for the one for the kitchen is that all right that'd be great Emperor's Effects, they make this very cool little box, which is essentially a pedal, which has an entire modular environment stuffed within it with, you know, 80 odd effects, 100 and gazillion odd different modules, LFOs, uh, sequences, modulators, envelopes, oscillators all stuck together through effects. You, you got a load of buttons on the top, you tap the buttons, make noises. <laughs> it's like a, it's like an awesome programmable groove box sequencer music making funky machine that that cool people stick in their satchels and pull out while they're on the train and go to make a load of music it's a fantastic thing it looks you know great and funky it's all light up and stuff and i imagine you can while away hours just playing with the thing well they've now stuck that in euro rack there you go so <laughs> euro rack which you know you're familiar with having one module per function so this one mixes this one is a filter you know this one is a sequencer no 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 no. you stick the whole lot in a single module and it's all in there behind buttons and menus so the thing will do everything it's got stacks of effects stacks of sequencing modulation oscillators blah blah blah, blah. all that stuff stuck in a little tiny box stuck into your euro rack now I imagine for a lot of people that's an awesome idea. I mean, it is an awesome idea because it's a great product, without any doubt. I just, it's not the kind of thing that fills me with excitement for Eurorack. But the other side of that is that there's also a little case for it, so you can now run it as a desktop thing. I mean, because it's previously it's been a pedal, which you can run on your desktop, obviously, but it has these great big buttons on it that you would usually use with your feet. So essentially, what they've done, I think is that they've put it into a into a desktop box slightly nicer format with cv and stuff coming in and out that can also be racked up in your euro rack that's the way that i would see it because i don't think you necessarily need a module like that in your euro rack because it would overwhelm it you wouldn't actually need to do anything else you just really need that and i think it's a perfect thing to play with as a desktop unit yeah all right it's in your euro rack which you can then patch into just a few other things i think that works I think that's a nice idea like that. You know, it's just seeing it as a Eurorack module is a slightly weird. I can't wrap my head around that. But seeing it as a as a groove box sequencing modulating machine that you can then patch a few things into. Yeah, yeah, I can go with that. I can go with that. Now, Roland were there and they had their big Jupiter X on display and other bits and bobs and things and stuff. And all of that's that's cool. We quite like the Jupiter X and the Jupiter XM. It seems to be an extraordinarily capable synthesizer in a small format that we're still trying to get our heads around exactly what it's all about. But what came out of the show that was interesting for me was an article all about their Zencore technology. Now Zencore is something which was listed in the specs of the Jupiter XM and they talked about it briefly, about it being some kind of sound engine and it has a different form of modeling it's not the same modeling as the modeling they've used previously which gets a little bit what is it so is it like acb no it's now acm or something else some kind of analog it's not analog circuitry circuit behavior anymore it's now uh, analog modeling oh i don't know but essentially what i'm trying to say is that there was a, a fabulous article with the ceo of roland whose name i can't pronounce and he essentially related the story as to what the heck Roland are doing. Because Roland come under a lot of criticism for not giving people what they want. Because people want things. And apparently we deserve to have them. We deserve to have a proper 
analog 808 909 101 and all those other old bits of synthesizer we deserve to have a proper reissued analog jupiter 8 apparently those are the sort of things that we deserve it doesn't matter how many times roland uh, produce a boutique version or a software version or a plug-in version it doesn't matter about the amount of work they put in into producing digital versions of awesome analog gear we want we want the thing we want the box and obviously behringer has capitalized on that in releasing the things that people want in hardware that's fine so it was really interesting to hear from the ceo about what it is that roland are doing and i found that it I found that extremely illuminating and has definitely helped me understand what they're trying to do. I mean, not that I've been under any illusions because Roland are a synthesizer company, a future looking synthesizer company, and they're phenomenally successful and they produce synthesizers for a market that wants what they do. And so it was just interesting to hear them talk about that. So what were, in a nutshell, what he was saying was that something like the Jupiter XM is exactly where they've been heading for a long time and kind of represents everything about synthesis that, that he loves, that he enjoys, that he wants to put forward into the future. So a number of things, massive sound engine that just sounds awesome about every form of synthesis, has to be portable, has to be tweakable, has to essentially be an entire studio in a box. So it has effects, it has audio ins and outs, it has the sound engine, it has the tweakability, all of those things. And that, as far as he's concerned, is the is the ideal, is to have a, a single synthesizer that you can take anywhere, you can play anywhere. It's got built-in speakers, it can run on batteries, and yet it has this massive sound engine that you can be anything at all, and you can plug it into your computer and use it in a door. You know, that's the ultimate dream of the ultimately versatile synthesizer product. And that's that's what they've done. And you think, oh, all right. It's interesting just to know where it is that you're coming from. And they're not interested in looking back. I mean, they are to a degree because they've produced all these plug-in versions of their synthesizers. And that technology is still very much alive in all this new stuff. But they want to take that to new places. So they want to, to digitize, to make the convenience of that useful but while retaining the, the level of sound. And the Zen core idea is this new processor, microprocessor, you know, like a DSP or an F, you know, a field grid, grid array type system that models the entire idea of a synthesizer. So whereas ACB, their current technology, has been modeling circuits, this sort of models the whole vibe of a synthesizer. How does that differ? I don't have any clue, but that's the idea. Now, the brilliant thing about the Zencore is that it's completely transferable. So any Roland synth that has Zencore technology inside can run any of the sounds from any other synthesizer that has Zencore in it. So the Zencore sounds can move from one synth to another. So you could have your Jupiter X in the studio, you could work up some fantastic sounds, and then you can fire that preset off to your Jupiter XM and take that to the gig and play that. Or to your Kronos, or to your MC-707, or to your MC-101, which also has the Zen core inside. So that's interesting. In fact, you could almost see the point where Roland just produced this little box, a Zen core box, which just has all the sounds inside, and you access it via a MIDI controller or some other bits and pieces. But it's a really interesting uh, way forward, an interesting level of technology, an interesting level of modeling and sound generation and sound creation, which could potentially give those synthesizers a massive range of sounds that could ever expand. Yeah, so I mean, I've no idea if I've explained that particularly well, but this Zencore idea is a very unifying uh, technology and into that sound system they will bring in all of their analog stuff all of their digital stuff all of their hybrid stuff all of their modeling stuff everything everything can be modeled by this technology and uh, so you have one synth with everything in it i think it's ultimately where they're getting to and that's that's really interesting really interesting it's still not giving you an 808 or a 303 or a 101 but there you go Um, Modal Electronics have their Argon 8, which they released at the end of last year, which is a, a, a decent, interesting-sized wavetable 
synthesizer, lots of voices and polyphony and lots of hands-on control. I'm still yet to play one myself, but I understand that they're they're pretty interesting and and fun to play with and certainly the level of control you're getting is awesome well they didn't have any new products as such at the show they just had different versions of the argon 8 so the argon 8 you know with the little keyboard has now been expanded to a 61 note keyboard which is great so you've got more playability slightly weird in that all of the controls are exactly the same as a small one and they're bumped over to the left which so you're playing here and you have to always reach over here to control stuff and control stuff back to playing control stuff i don't think it's quite like that because it's only a 61 note keyboard it's not like an 88 or something it's just a little kind of oh okay interesting design decision the other thing they did is release a desktop version which again same deal all the same stuff inside just without the keyboard same knobs and bits and pieces great that's good i'm quite keen to try out one of these argon 8s i need to to see if i can track one down at some point <laughs> Now Arturia had a couple of things going on. Probably the biggest thing was their Keystep Pro. Keystep Pro is like the Beatstep Pro, but with a keyboard attached. But it's more than that. Beatstep Pro is the one little desktop sequencer that lots and lots of modular people use. It was, gave you a couple of channels of sequencing and a drum channel, and it had old school, you know, pads and knobs and things. Great, very performance friendly. You could glitch it and loop it in different ways. Great, sequencer, desktop thing, good. So they've taken their awesome product and they've stuck it into a keyboard, but they've done more with it than that. It now has four sequences inside. One of them can be dedicated to drums, so you can sort that out. And that gives you 16 tracks of drums. You know, if you imagine it being MIDI, 16 channels of, it can do that, but it does that with control voltage as well. And then the other channels are MIDI and control voltage, polyphonic as well, if you're using MIDI. So they've taken the Beatstep Pro, which is a, a good comprehensive sequencer and expanded it, added a keyboard, added more channels, more tracks, more polyphony, and they've made it into quite an awesome sequencing controlling workstation. I mean, that's quite a thing. And I imagine for performing modular people, but for anyone performing with analog, synths and bits and pieces as well, or mixing the MIDI and the analog together in live performance, that's going to be a huge, a huge thing. You're going to see it all over the place. The other thing they did is that they upgraded the MicroFreak. Not a new MicroFreak, they just upgraded the firmware. They've stuck in a bunch of new presets. Oh, that's nice. They've added a new oscillator. That's a noise oscillator they've stuck in there. They've sorted out the copying from patterns from one to another they've added scaling and a chord function so you can just press a button hold the notes and it then plays a one finger chord that kind of thing and they've introduced a shift and hold in order to just to nuke the matrix modulation matrix thingy which is great so yeah a, a decent helpful update i've done a whole video on it that you can go and check out if you like Erica Synths, who usually have a whole range of modules and stuff to show at NAMM, only had the one thing. The one thing was the baseline. It was the darkest, blackest, deepest, meanest looking 303 baseline clone you have ever seen. It's awesome. I mean, all the Bakelite knobs, the, the, the glowing red from the black, it's just a fabulous. What? A, I mean, what? What a fabulous thing. They call it the DB01, which isn't particularly inspiring. It should just be called Death by Acid or something like that. And it's just great. I mean, Erica Sins always do great stuff. I mean, why on earth would anybody bring out a 303 clone kind of thing? Not exactly, sort of, kind of, uh, in the wake of what Behringer have done, you know, with, with the TD3. Well, because it's awesome. Because it's awesome to release products like that. Because they're fantastic. Because it's a different feel. You know, it's like we get into this situation where people are saying, well, why, why do that? Since, you know, we'll just wait for the Behringer one. But that's that's pointless. That's like saying, well, what's the point of Fender or Gibson? Why don't you just wait for the Epiphone version of the guitar? Well, because these things are, are different. They all have different vibes, different feels. And it's to do with that that look and that feel and that the way you approach an instrument and the way it gives back all those things are different different in different machines different in different things so Ericsson's releasing a bass line that's awesome because I know full well that that's going to be a fierce and chunky machine that's going to reward me playing with it do I know anything more about it no I can't remember it just you know was awesome on the video and the video is particularly spectacular because there's like a dead cat it's a dead cat sitting there while they're going dead cat 
I don't think the cat's dead, but it looked like it was. <laughs> Pittsburgh Modular were there. They were showing off their cascading delay network. What's that? Well, it's four delays that cascade into each other as some kind of network, I imagine. I mean, why have one delay when you can have four, I, I suppose, is the idea. But it, yeah, fabulous looking module with what looks like four of their analog delays. But funny enough, they're not analog delays, they're digital delays because if you have four analog delays and you chain them up, the amount of noise that's being generated by those circuits just gets overwhelming. And so they tried that out and that didn't work. So they found another chip, which is a, a digital chip. Apparently it's, they take it out of some karaoke machine and it's clean enough, but it has this feel to it that's analog enough to fit perfectly with what Pittsburgh like to do. So you've got four of these things, you can arrange them in series, in parallel, in different ways, it can either go like one delay after another, like a multi-tap, or it can be strange things and modulated and feedback back into the other and that kind of thing. It's the sort of thing that's just fun to play with, which is something that Pittsburgh do very well. The other thing they did is they've given their SV1 a bit of a paint job so that it now matches all the new lifeform stuff that they do, which is great because I never liked, I never liked the old look. I was always put off Pittsburgh because of the way, I don't know, it just looked a bit, to me, it looked like old medical equipment, which I don't find that's a particularly good look. So I'm really pleased that they've, uh, they've decided to go slightly darker, this dark blues and these dark greys and blacks. That's great. I mean, I like the Microvolt when they released that, and that was a, you know, the blue lights and the black. That was great. That was much more appealing to me than the stuff they'd done previously to that. So awesome. Looks like a fantastic, interesting, big module. Uses up a lot of HP, but you could get a lot of fun out of it. Qubit. They had four modules. They like to do that. They like to release things in banks of four. And this year was no exception. They make wonderfully clean looking futuristic digital Eurorack modules. And this year we were treated to a bit of bending, a bit of shaping, a bit of modeling, a bit of uh, ratcheting, I think it was. First of all, we got the Aurora, which is a spectral reverb. Nice sounding, nice sounding reverb, which includes a, a phase vocoder and the ability to freeze the input. You know, a bit cloud-like, I suppose. Next one is the Data Bender, which the idea is that it gives you kind of the glitching and weirdness of CD skipping and digital crappiness, which I'm not altogether <laughs> convinced that that's a good idea. But hey, we like a bit of glitching, I suppose. So there you go. There's Surface, which is a multi-timbral resonator type physical modeling thing. Now this has strings and plucks in, but it also has marimbas and skins and malady things and stuff like that. It can have up to eight unique voices and you can use different modules at the same time, kind of giving it a bit of multi timbrality that share those voices. So that's very interesting. That's probably the most interesting module, I think, of their lot. I mean, last year where they had Bloom and they had weird things going on, which were kind of complicated and interesting and like, oh yeah, creative. These ones, I don't know, not quite so, not quite so engaging. I mean, a reverb, that's cool. I'm into the reverb kind of thing, but there's a lot of that about, if you know what I mean. But the physical modeling one, yeah, that's interesting. With those eight voices, you could get a lot going on in there. And I use my 2HP plug an awful lot. And so, yeah, I can see there's something very interesting in that particular the one that they're calling Surface. The last one is called Cascade, which is a bit of a ratcheting envelope. And it's got all sorts of things like bursting and freezing and stuff. I mean, as with all Qubit modules, the explanations are never really that comprehensive. And so you're looking at videos of them going, mm, um, I don't really know. I don't really know. I mean, that happens. That's normal. That's normal Qubit stuff. I mean, it took me a year to work out that Bloom was something that I actually wanted. And now that I have one, I still haven't quite gotten to the bottom of it. But they always make sort of deep and interesting stuff. I mean, maybe that's why the Surface one uh, appeals to me because I know what it is. I understand it almost immediately. Whereas the other ones are a bit kind of, oh, well, yeah, okay, we'll have to wait and see. But, you know, as always, the Qubit stuff is mighty and excellent. Noise Engineering were there with three new modules, I think. But I think what's important about what they brought was that they brought a couple of platforms. 
So what that means is that they've developed their own either a, a DSP chip or a language or, or something. They've developed something which can run lots of things. So they've got an oscillator, which is running a DSP platform that they can upload different firmwares to and upload different oscillators to. Comes with three oscillators to start with, and they'll be releasing other ones that you can upload to it. That's very interesting, because noise engineering, all their modules are digital, I think, for the most part. And so it makes sense for digital modules to have that kind of openness, that ability to be upgraded with new features or completely different features. I like the fact that that's becoming more common because it means that you can buy a module and potentially you can change it into different things. It makes it very versatile and useful. And they had another one which was an effect which currently has uh, some crazy reverb in it because yeah, this is still noise engineering so it's going to be crazy. So it's got a crazy reverb in it but that again can be multi-effects and they can upload new firmwares to have different effects and different things going on. Now if I can find the names, I will attempt them for you. So the oscillator one is called Vert ITER or, or, or ITER and it comes with as I say three oscillators and something about audio rate phase modulation and the effects DSP platform is called Desmodus Versio Desmodus Versio let's go for that Desmo Desi Desi Verto Desi Versio there you go Des Versio and yeah, you can stick in new algorithms and it uh, comes with a reverb it can be all sorts of different multi effects pretty cool and finishing off my choices from NAM is the lunchbox from 2HP. Oh, it's a lovely thing. It's just a little box. It's a little box. It's a black box as well with a hinged lid that's got a bunch of modules inside. Gorgeous. What a lovely thing to do. I mean, perfect, obviously, for 2HP because of all their weeny little modules that they do. Although I would say that once you've packed this thing full of 2HP modules, it's going to be pretty tiny getting in there. But while they're at it, 2HP also released three new modules. One's a looper that loops stuff up to five minutes of audio you can record into there and just loop it back like forever they've also released a compressor and a pitch shifter so lots of interesting tools to put into your lunchbox along with your sandwiches and your flask of tea and finally that brings me back to behringer of course who weren't at the show they had this place called bannerheim right because <laughs> that's funny right so it sounds a bit like anaheim but bannerheim with Behringer and anyway they were in some warehouse in Germany somewhere I imagine uh, releasing new and quite amazing things writing of course on all the press coverage of NAM and being all part of that and in some way sticking two fingers up at the whole organization going yeah 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 you can all be at NAM smoozing and schmoozing around yeah but we're here just releasing stuff <laughs> so that's what they did so what was it all about? Well, Behringer have been threatening to release some Eurac for a long time. Uli has been in conversations with lots of forums and bits and pieces asking what sort of Eurac you'd like, what do you want it to be about? And they, in fact, I think it was about nine months ago, they suggested that they might do the, the Roland System 100M. They might take that old modular system and do it as Eurac modules. And people went, yeah, right, that might be nice. And then pff, didn't really hear anything more. Lo and behold, here they come. The first lot is the System 100 from Behringer. And they have modelled all of those Roland System 100M modules and stuck them into Eurac modules. And you can build an entire System 100M style system with them. And it's awesome. I mean, it looks apart, probably sounds apart. I imagine it's got all the same features as that old uh, Roland thing had. You've got dual oscillators, dual filters, dual VCAs, dual envelopes. I mean, everything was kind of packed in to work together. And that's what's interesting about this. I mean, there are 11 modules in total and the prices apparently are going to range from about 50 to to $100 per module. So, you know, for under a grand, you could have an entire modular system in a case working, you know, that's supposed to be together. And that's going to please an enormous amount of people, I imagine. Then, not content with that, they then released the System 55. Now, we'd seen a few of these modules before because when they announced their Eurorack Go case uh, a few weeks ago, there were a couple of these Moog style modules knocking around. And that was like, all oh, right, so they're going to release some, some Moog clones as well. And so they did. But with this, there's like 20 modules. And they're taken from the Series 55, 35, and the Model 15 from the Moog modular. 
amazing. I mean, they look great. They they seem to be calmer and they look more elegant, perhaps, than the System 100 ones uh, because of the design of the front panel and the knobs and bits and pieces. It just looks somehow more elegant, I think. But you have the whole range of modules that you get in the Moog modular, all of the stuff. And what becomes interesting about both of these, about the System 100 and the System 55, is that they are authentically replicating these old modular systems. Now, that means they're also replicating the the labeling and the routing and the way it uses control voltage. They're not taking these as ideas and redoing them in a modern format. They're taking those ideas and doing them. So that means you have things like S-Trig, within the Moog modular system, which nobody uses anymore. S-Trig is when you trigger something by having no voltage. We tend to use V-Trig and everything. All the Eurorack triggers are all V-Trig in that they trigger something by having voltage high. So you turn on a voltage to trigger something, which you know, makes a lot more logical sense, really. But in Moog modular, a lot of things are done with S-Trig, which is the removal of voltage in order to trigger something. And these modules have that built in along with an S-Trig to V-Trig converter thing. And this is interesting. I mean, it's what that does is that it makes a perfectly authentic Moog modular system for people who want a perfectly authentic Moog modular system. Same with the System 1, the way those modules are put together, the way that lots of them are dual featured, uh, the way the routing works and how that all hangs together. It's very, very authentic. All I'm trying to say at this point is that I don't know that that's always the best route because what for me, these modules are going to do, these Behringer modules are essentially going to introduce a whole another generation of people to modular, which is awesome. I mean, it's awesome that we can get access to these sorts of things for these sorts of prices. My only reservation or my concern with that is that the System 100 is slightly complicated and the Moog modular is very much a standalone system because when these systems were originally conceived and originally built, it wasn't, modular wasn't about having different modules from different manufacturers. It was about having a modular system so you could swap out different modules, but normally, probably, from the same manufacturer. So your System 100 would be made up of System 100 modules, not modules from other people as well. Your Moog modular, similarly, would be only Moog. So they're not designed necessarily with the idea of mixing and matching into larger modular systems. But of course you can do that, absolutely. It just doesn't have that emphasis. So would people buy a single System 100 module and drop that into a larger Eurorack? How would that work? Or would people more likely be buying an entire System 100 system and then trying to make that work. In which case that's quite hard because also Eurorack has evolved and changed and modernized and is easier. It's also more complicated. You know, it's gone in both ways in that you can buy simple modules, a simple oscillator, simple filter, simple VCAs and have them all working relatively simply together. Whereas something like the System 100 is quite complicated. The Moog modular is quite complicated. The terms that they use, the terminology, this whole S-trig thing, the, the sort of voltage that it uses, the, the names and the way things modulate and hang together. It's all very different and it's not exactly the same as what modern Eurorack is about. So we have kind of a couple of things going on here. We have the awesome authenticity versus how well it's going to integrate into other Eurorack. And that's an interesting question. And that's a question I would very much like to get into at some point. So I am very much hoping certainly to get hold of the System 100 modules in some form at some time, as, you know, as soon as humanly possible, to look at how do you integrate that into a larger Eurorack system or how the heck do you use it on its own? Because if a lot of beginners are going to be coming into Eurorack because of these Behringer modules, then there's going to be a lot of need for hand-holding, I think, and help in making that work. How do you patch this stuff together? How does it work? How easy is that? You know, and that's the sort of thing that I'd very much like to, to help people with. So both of those announcements were very, very exciting, I think. And there's a whole load of people out there who just can't quite believe that they're gonna have access to this sort of, this sort of sound and way of working that has been dreamt about for, for years and years and years and has not been available to anyone who doesn't have stacks of money and the ability to maintain vintage gear, you know? So 
that's an extraordinary, an extraordinary thing. But they didn't stop there. Of course not. They also had another thing up their sleeve. And I'm not talking about the RD6 because I don't really care about the RD6. Oh yeah, they released an RD6, which is essentially a 606 drum machine. Woo-wee! Great. No, what I'm talking about is the 2600. They have their own ARP 2600 clone that they've been working on. We know they've been working on it. There's been pictures of the case knocking around for ages. You know, Uli said, look, here it is. We're working on a 2600, isn't that cool? We went, yeah, that's, that's cool. And here it is, almost. It's not quite finished. They're on like prototype two or something. So in order to announce their 2600, Behringer did something which I thought was quite uh, astute, intelligent, quite full of genius perhaps and that is that they rolled out uh, AMA Synths Rob Keeble. Now Rob has been making Eurac modules under AM Synths for many years and the majority of his work is on recreating and replicating the modules and bits of technology in ARP synthesizers in ARP 2600 inside the Odyssey bits and pieces like that and so he is already very practiced at understanding the ARP synthesizers and also building clones of their parts. And so last year, I think it was, he responded to Uli's call for engineers and, and synthesizer makers to come and join Behringer in order to push forward on all these projects that they've got. So Rob uh, said, yeah, I'd love to work on a bit of that. And he's been, as far as we can understand it, he's been one of the, the key designers behind the Behringer 2600. And that's interesting because I believe that he kind of lent this whole gravitas to the announcement rather than having you know the, the fruity behringer people going Ta -da! here's another great synth that we've made uh, this is a, a bloke who's been working on this whole thing his whole life really and is deeply into synthesis design and understands these circuits and was be and was totally able to speak intelligently about the ARP 2600 they had in the first part of the video an original ARP 2600 and he talked about it and talked about what it was like to uh, to get in and recreate these circuits. And then in the second one, they revealed the actual product and he was able to talk intelligently about that. And I think that's brilliant. That's exactly the sort of thing that we needed to hear. We need that connection between uh, people, engineers, the people who are actually doing it and are passionate about it. Because that, I believe, offsets some of the, the noise, the, the, the weird discussions we have about, oh, no, they're just copying this, they're just copying that and the other, that's not fair, they shouldn't do it, that's cheating or stealing or something. And no, I mean, I've always thought that that's exactly what or where Eurorack has come from. Eurorack came into being because of Dopefer's desire to replicate a Moog oscillator and filter, to replicate a Moog modular system in a smaller form that he could build himself and enjoy and afford. Eurorack is based on cloning. It just is. That's where it all comes from. And so a lot of the criticism aimed at Behringer about that kind of thing just doesn't seem to sit right. It, it's not quite right right because as a as an industry i mean any industry really builds upon the past and uses past ideas to build and push forward and do new things and sometimes a recreation of something that is old brings that technology to a whole new generation of people particularly if it's something that isn't currently made by somebody else it gets into murkier waters when you're cloning something that's already being made by somebody else but you know who knows those are discussions for other times but in this instance I think the presence of Rob in those videos just highlighted the fact that it's not Behringer who clone things, they're not the clone masters, it's not, you know, Behringer aren't the people who invented the idea of cloning things. It's been going on for a very long time. And essentially what we have is this, is this guy, Rob has been building modules for decades, has been given the opportunity to build an entire 2600. Because the technology is there, the manufacturing is there, and the affordability is there so that he can, if you like, fulfill his life's ambition of building ARP 2600s. And that's awesome. There's something really genuinely cool about that. Anyway, all that aside, what do we have? Because it's very interesting because Korg have their ARP 2600, their reinvention, and it's worth a fortune and is sold out and is like three, four thousand pounds. What were Behringer going to do? We were all kind of sitting there going, oh, what about, are they going to release exactly the same thing and sell it for 500 quid? You know, what is going to be the deal with this? Well, 
I think I was quite relieved when they revealed what it was physically because it was different. And that I think is important because there's a lot of hardware in the ARC 2600 which Korg have replicated. And that's why well, one of the reasons why it's so expensive is this massive case, this massive bulk of stuff, as well as all the, you know, the actual components used inside. Whereas what Behringer have done is that they've taken that, they've shrunk everything down to surface mount, uh, and that brings with it some advantages as well that Rob talked about in, the, in terms of it being less sensitive to temperature and other bits and pieces, as well as miniaturization and lowering the cost. They've changed the case dramatically, so you've really just got a, a front panel which fits into a kind of a rack case, although there's some discussion over whether it's actually a 19-inch rack or something else, uh, and it can also sit on a desktop. It doesn't come with the keyboard or those sorts of external features. It's just a front panel with all the sliders and lights and bits and pieces on it. And it looks great. It looks interesting. It looks like the sort of thing that would actually fit on your desk as opposed to this enormous piece of furniture that you'd have to cope with if you've got the real thing. So all of these differences, all of these things, the way they've presented it, I think is has been really good i'm encouraged by that and i think that it's turned it into this unfathomable instrument that no one can really afford down to something which is achievable attainable and should sound as near as damn it and give you the playing experience of that real thing that for me is 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 pretty awesome and does generate this instrument that i could potentially own at some point now, it's not ready. It's still on prototype stage. They are planning to have it ready for Superbooth, which is usually in May. And by then, we should know the sort of price that it's going to be and the availability and, and what that's all about. There's plenty of stuff that wasn't there. There was no mention of the, the CS80 clone they're allegedly working on or the Oberheim one. Uh, there's still no sign of the RD9, which is interesting. So NAM this year brought us some awesomeness with the Eurac and the ARC 2600 and also some questions over where are these other things that they're supposed to be working on. But I'm sure these things will turn up in time. And just to note that this morning they revealed a bracket. <laughs> I wonder if that's res in response to the video that I did on their 104 HP skiff, which is what I've got here, which doesn't quite fit the Moog three tier bracket. So they produced their own bracket, which is very, very, very similar to this, but it fits their case perfectly. It also fits their uh, range of semi-modular synths. It fits the, the K2 and the Pro 1 and the Neutron and the Model D and the CAT and the Wasp. All of those can now go into these lovely three tier console style things like this, which I think is, is just really quite brilliant. And all of these things are coming together, together with the System 100 and System 55 modules, which should be along. I mean, all the stuff they showed at the show were kind of straight out of manufacturing. They're kind of the prototype ones. So they're still a fair while off actually having these mass produced. But we shall see in time. I'm looking forward to giving these things a go and opening up and seeing what occurs. So there you go, that was a, a big long one of all the cool things from NAM. If there are other things that I'd missed, just you know, let me know in the comments about uh, stuff that I hadn't thought of. But those were the things that interested me most from last weekend's craziness at the 2020 NAM show. I don't think we're gonna have a live stream this week. So I did two live streams last week and I think that's enough. I don't think we need to get together again quite so soon so i'm going to wait until the february edition of malt music monthly and we'll have another live stream at the end of february i think that would be cool gives us time to chill out and relax in the meantime i've got a lot of videos underway and coming along i've done a couple of diy ones recently which enables me to finish my rack so i can get all this plumbed in properly and i can start making videos on a whole stack of modules that i've got in here that i haven't talked about properly i'm also finishing off the audio pc uh, windows tutorial and i have stuff to do on the surface pro 7. all of that is coming in the next in the next few weeks i think but i think that's plenty for now thanks very much for watching if you'd like to support me further with making videos and bits and pieces then do sign up subscribe you can join me on patreon and throw me a couple of quid if you fancy or follow us on instagram twitter facebook all the usual places and join this little community of people who are enjoying talking about synthesizers and looking at my face on the screen for some reason that'd be great and in the meantime go and make some tunes <laughs> <laughs>